All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is David Castor with Easy Power, and uh, it's our weekly Thursday webinar. So I'd like to welcome all of you here today. We're going to just kind of informally go through the short circuit calculations using Easy Power, and hopefully maybe uh, point out some features and capabilities that will be new to you, or maybe just some review. So um, I've just got a file open here that's. Uh, one of the sample files delivered with the program. It's called, it's bigger, B-I-G-G-E-R. We're just going to run through some basic things about performing short circuit calculations in Easy Power and some of the options that are available. So, um, so as you are probably aware, when you build your model, you're in database edit. To do any kind of uh, analysis, you have to go to one of the various analysis packages, depending on what you have in your program in your license. So we're going to focus on the short circuit today. So to do short circuit calcs, you have to first go into short circuit focus. And that's going to be, which is by click on this uh, little lightning bolt here. Now, if I had any missing information in my model that would prevent easy power from doing the short circuit calculations, I would get an error message at that point, And it would provide me with a list of missing information or problems with the model. So um, it just would have to go kind of work through that list. Things like cable lengths uh, are going to be a problem. You'll have to fill something in there, impedances, motor horsepowers, X over R ratios, that kind of thing. Those will prevent you from getting into short circuit at all. So assuming you have all the proper information and you can get into short circuit, then you're going to see a screen that looks like this. You'll see that in short circuit focus, we turn off a lot of the uh, annotation on the screen, the descriptive information, just to kind of uh, make it less cluttered. We're going to be putting short circuit data on the screen. So um, we just remove some of that information that we normally present in database just to allow you to uh, see the short circuit information a little bit easier. Now, uh, short circuit calculations are done on a per bus basis, regardless of whether or not you fault every bus or fault one bus. Easy Power and every, every other program is going to fault one bus at a time, and then it just does it really fast. So it seems to all be happening at once. So because of that, I can actually control how many buses I fault when I run the fault analysis. And that's just determined by what I have selected, what buses or MCCs or panels I have selected when I go up here and click fault buses. So if I have nothing selected and I hit fault buses, it's just going to fault every bus. So we'll go ahead and do that and you can see what that looks like. So the first thing I notice is I'm in equipment duty focus here, or equipment duty report mode. I'm going to change back to the half cycle. So these options up here, when I'm in short circuit, I have short circuit options and I my menu changes up here so I can control what I display on the screen here. So I'm going to do a half cycle, which is the normal peak short circuit current. So anytime I make a change here, it's going to automatically rerun the last calculation that I did. So it reran the, it faulted every bus and presented me with, this is the half cycle fault data. Okay. So we'll just take a quick look at what it's showing me here and then we'll kind of take a step back and look at some of the various options. So when I run a fault count, what I see on the screen is basically this value here is the total bus fault current. Again, this is for the half cycle momentary fault, 28,934 amps. So this is in kiloamps, so 28.394. And you have some control over how many digits get displayed here. These values here are showing me the contributions from each of the sources of fault current into this bus. All right. So I've got 13,000 and a little bit more from each one of these two buses and the rest of it, so that's about, what, 26 and a half or so. The rest of the short circuit current comes from the motor contributions that are coming back up through the system. So one thing to keep in mind is this value, these the summations are done using phasers. So this is going to depend on the phase angle of the current 
which varies depending on what X over R ratio you have for a particular motor or cable or feeder or whatever. So this is a basically vector sum, phasor summation of all these. If you directly add all these numbers, they might be slightly off from this value, and that's that's because um, again, it's it's doing an actual phasor sum. All right, so that's what happens if I have nothing selected and I do fault buses. I'm going to fault every bus. I also have the option of only faulting selected buses. So if I right click here, I can do a clear. I can clear my fault data. Now if I double click on any one bus, it's going to fault just that one bus. So if this bus 3 here, if I double click on this bus now, now it faults just that single bus. Okay, and I can come down here and double click that bus. So that's a quick way to look at the fault current for any one particular bus. So if you're doing some kind of arc flash calculation or equipment duty calculation, that's an easy way to do that. So we can also fault multiple buses by just our normal method of pressing down the shift key, selecting multiple buses. And now it's going, when I hit fault buses up here, it's going to fault the buses that I have selected and just those buses, okay? So any one of those methods will work to generate a short circuit calculation. All right, so that's kind of the basic interaction that you do to get the program to run your fault calculations. Now let's look at some of the options that are available. And um, on the screen here, you'll see uh, this controls what, I, what gets displayed, basically, and then also what type of fault is going to be calculated. So if we start down here, this button, which is the default, is the three-phase fault. So this is a three-phase fault. This is what we've been running. If I select this option, that's a line-to-ground fault. So I, if I just click now, it's going to rerun that for these three buses that we had just done. It's going to rerun that as a line-to-ground fault. And you'll see the values are very low. And the reason for that is because we have this uh, resistance grounding here on their neutrals. This is a double line to ground, so it's going to change what's being displayed to CB or C phase here. And you'll see some interesting results here based on the direction of the currents. And the final option is the line to line fault. Okay. So I'll go back to three phase. Now, this choice here displays which phase of fault current is being displayed. And I can display more than one. So if I select A and B, I see two values of current. And if I pick A, B, and C, I can see all three. Now, this isn't too interesting because this is a three-phase fault, so these are always going to be the same, right? Now, if I were to go at some other part of the system down here, let's uh, I think I picked a bad example today. If I come down here and let's say I'm going to run a line-to-line uh, -line fault, Now, it's telling me it's displaying B phase. So if I look at C phase, that value is going to be the same because it's assuming a fault between B phase B and C. Phase A is going to be zero because it's a line-to-line -line fault. So there is no current in phase A. So phase A is always going to be the first one, phase B, and then phase C. And same way with the contributions, okay? So that's one option you have for display. The other option you have is rather than displaying phase currents, I can display the sequence currents. Easy Power uses symmetrical components to do all of its fault calculations. So it has knowledge of the positive, negative, and zero sequence fault currents. Um, 
it's probably not going to cover a lot about the theory of symmetrical components, but it allows us to com compute three-phase and unbalanced faults in a relatively straightforward way in terms of the computation. So I can look at the plus sign is the positive sequence. I can look at negative sequence, and I can look at zero sequence. So you can see for this line-to-line -line fault, I have positive and negative sequence are the same. Zero sequence is zero. I can also look at 3i0 instead of this series single phase zero sequence, but that's going to be zero as well for a line-to-line -line fault. So if I were to go back now to a database real quick, I'm going to change this transformer to a grounded Y so I can do some ground fault calculations that give me an answer other than zero. So if I go back to short circuit, now if I come back and say I want to do a line to ground fault, if I double click, this is the short circuit current for a phase A to ground fault. So phase A is 26,000 amps, phase B is going to be zero, and phase C is going to be zero, all right? I can also look at the uh, sequence currents. And line to ground fault, the sequence currents are all equal. The three sequence networks are in series. If I look at 3i0, that's basically corresponds to the current going into the ground. And that's equal to the phase A fault current, as you'd expect, okay? Now, Let's go back. We say that the three sequence currents are equal. That's only true at the point of the fault. That won't be true for the rest of the system. My contributions will not necessarily be equal. So here from the transformer, I've got positive sequence 5300, negative sequence 5300, and zero sequence is higher at 8.8. .8. From these motors, the motors are assumed to be ungrounded, so there is no zero sequence current coming from the motors. So the individual contributions can vary, but at the point of the fault, for a fault, the three sequence currents will be, be equal. All right, so that's some options we have for displaying the currents. If we go into short circuit options, now remember, I, I can't access this unless I'm in short circuit. If I go back to database, I won't see this short circuit options and short circuit reports any longer. All right, so if I go to short circuit options, I have four categories here. The first one is called the control, and you'll see the fault type is going to match what I have here. So this is essentially the same setting, just two different ways to do it. Uh, the fault all filters gives me an option of re automatically filtering out what I'm faulting. So you, know, you can do it by bus area and zone, which is an easy power concept for segregating your system into different groups or categories or facilities or buildings or whatever. So I can, to each bus, I can assign an area and a zone number. I can also do it by voltage level. So if I only wanted to fault the 480 volt systems in my model, I can just change the minimum KV to 470 and then the maximum to 500 maybe, and it's only going to fault the 480 volt buses. Driving point voltage, this is basically the pre-fault voltage. The default is going to be one per unit, so if I have a 480 volt system, it's going to have a, it's going to start at 480 volts. Um, so this is something, particularly if you're doing arc flash calcs, you may want to, uh, if you have a system where the voltage always runs high or low, you may want to adjust this because basically if I increase this driving point voltage by 1%, my fault current is going to go up by 1% more or less. So uh, the driving point voltage should be set to match kind of the maximum voltage you'd expect on your system to come up with a maximum fault current value for arc flash or equipment duty concerns. Equipment duty threshold is minus 10%. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is when it starts generating a warning. 
as your equipment duties approach their ratings. Voltage sensitivity threshold allows us to create, flag things on the one line or create a report for a single bus fault where I have, I can look at the voltages throughout the system and see where for a fault on bus A, how many of my other buses, if the voltage drops below 70%, I'm going to get a, it's going to flag that for me, okay. And the last setting is the X over R calculation method. Um, so the default is going to be ANSI. That's the most conservative. This is uh, particularly of concern when we're doing circuit breaker duty calculations. Standard complex would be how you would were taught to do it in school. You just reduce the network down and whatever the X over R ratio ends up to be in your Thevenin and equivalent, that's, that's that value. Characteristic current is just another method. Um, it was a paper written a few years ago about this. It's documented on the help file for Easy Power if you're more interested. Typically, you're going to use ANSI because that's going to be consistent with the ANSI circuit breaker duty calculation requirements. So remember, this only affects the X over R calculation. But it turns out that using the standard X over R ratio that you would compute in your normal circuit reduction is not conservative because remember the symmetrical component fault calculation is basically a steady state calculation. And during the initial periods of the fault that we're concerned about, uh, the different sources have different X over R ratios of currents decaying at different rates. So um, we, using the standard complex method is not conservative, so ANSI requires a different method to do that. And, that's probably the subject of a, a different webinar, but basically we do a separate calculation of the impedance and the separate calculation of the resistance in the network to come up with the uh, ratio there. But again, this selection only affects the X over R ratio, not the actual calculation of the current itself. Okay, so let's go down to one line output. We'll come back and talk about text reports in a minute. So one line output. In addition to the options we talked about up here for what gets displayed, I have some additional choices. Um, this, if you want to see the CTs and the relays on, in short circuit focus, you can select this. Here's where I can select the uh, number of decimal places in the one line output. So if I want to only see two, I can just click that to two. Now, here's one that's probably the most interesting. Um, by default, the values of fault current we are displaying are the symmetrical. Uh, if you're familiar with the nature of short circuit currents, there's going to be typically for AC systems, there's going to be an asymmetrical current that decays over time and then a symmetrical current. So the asymmetrical current is a function of the X over R ratio of the system, and also the voltage phase angle at the time, the instant that the fault occurs. So the asymmetrical is of a, con a concern for circuit breaker duties, as well as sometimes relay settings for instantaneous relays. If you want to see the asymmetrical current, we have some choices here. So just as an example, let's We'll change this from symmetrical to asymmetrical. And if I say OK, it's going to rerun this. So now all of these current values are asymmetrical. So they're going to be higher than the, the symmetrical values. Probably the more useful option is to display both maximum symmetrical and maximum asymmetrical. All right, so the value in parentheses is the peak asymmetrical, the maximum asymmetrical current, RMS. So this value here is the symmetrical value. Here's the maximum asymmetrical, kind of the worst case asymmetrical RMS value. So a lot of devices like thermomagnetic breakers will respond to the asymmetrical current. The newer digital relays typically have filtering applied, so the 
DC offset current that creates the asymmetry is filtered out. But we also have to be concerned about the breaker equipment duties, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this gives you a way to display both the symmetrical and the asymmetrical. And so the higher your X over R ratio, the higher this asymmetrical current will be as a multiplier of the symmetrical current. So what we do is we do the symmetrical component calculation, gives us symmetrical current. We take the X over R ratios and basically back calculate the uh, asymmetrical current from that. Okay. So it's not a true transient analysis. We're just calculating a worst case asymmetrical current based on the symmetrical current. Okay, so let me oh, one other thing I'll mention this value is in kiloamps. We have an option for displaying it in per unit, which some people might like. And also an MVA, which is probably not that useful to you anymore. We don't have too many breakers that are actually rated in the MVA, but those are the options you have for the uh, current display. I'm going to change this back to symmetrical right now. Oh, and we can also display the um, angle if you want, or the real and imaginary component of the currents. Just it's to be a little, quite a bit of information to display, but if you're interested in the, in the calculated volt current angles, you're going to be typically lagging because your power system is going to be highly inductive. But this just is another option. All right. So I want to show you um, one other really useful feature we have in easy power and that's what we call the remote voltage and current. Uh, let me go back, we'll do a three phase fault here and just for this bus. So when I have a short circuit at this bus, we know that due to the high current and the voltage collapse here, this voltage is going to go to zero because we assume a bolted fault here. Right? We know that the voltage at the rest of the system will be affected. So typically it will be a big voltage sag throughout your system depending on how close you are to the fault. So Easy Power gives us a way to display the voltage and current from any bus in the system for a fault at one particular bus. So in this case, as soon as I find it again, we fault the switchgear 5 here. If I want to see what's happening to some other bus in my system, I can come down and right click, and down here it says remote bus voltage DNI voltage and current. So if I click that, it's going to tell me that this voltage here is 0.998 per unit, and the fault current's only uh, five five amps. Now I've still this is still my faulted bus here, switch gear five. If I go upstream to bus one and right click do a remote bus voltage and current, and I see my voltage is down to 0.963, still not that bad. And here's the fault current flowing for a fault downstream here. Right? It's on the primary side of the transformer, so the transformer is taking the brunt of the voltage drop. So for any bus, I can fault that bus Let's fault this bus here, bus 1. Now if I come over to bus 2, I can look at the remote voltage current. Here I'm down to 60% voltage because I've, it's electrically much closer to this fault. Right? So for this fault on bus 1, the bus 2 voltage is going to dip to 60%. If I right click on this, the voltage here is about the same. So this gives you a feel for what's happening to your system voltage anywhere in your system for any one particular bus fault. Okay. So if I go back to, I also have the option to print a voltage sensitivity report that's called. 
and this is only works if I have just one single bus that's faulted. And this is going to look at that criteria that I set, which is right now it's set at 70%. It's going to create a report. These are all the buses where the voltage dropped below 70% for the fault on bus one. All right, so it's just a way to get an idea of the impact on your system for a fault on any particular bus. And we worry about that because if I have motor starters or contactors, if the voltage gets below a certain value, 70%, maybe those contactors may start to drop out. So I need to know about that. All right, so in terms of looking at results on the screen, that's the major options that we have. And so the remote bus voltage and current is really useful for doing relay settings. If I have a fault here and I want to know what the current is upstream here, say coming out of my generator, I can look at that and see that I have 3,800 amps. So that would assist me with doing relay settings or something like that. Okay, so the other thing that we want to talk about is uh, the text reports and options for that. So there's a couple ways to get to that. We have a button here now for the text reports. It's also accessible if I go down to the, the text output. Okay. So if I click on short circuit reports, I have a list of the various options that I have. So if I just, we'll just start with a simple half cycle momentary report. So I tell it what I want to see in the, which reports I want to run, and also what I want to see in the report. And these different duties are going to list for the bus fault currents, are going to list the fault currents and the corresponding duties based on the system's X over R ratio and the asymmetrical current. And this, these duties will include any necessary derating of the interrupting rating of the breakers. So we'll leave that off for now. But so when I say OK, it's going to run that. And so the way Easy Power works is when I run a text report, it's going to be created, but it's going to be minimized down here. Okay. So if uh, most of the time your one line is going to get shrunk down a little bit and you'll be able to see it. But if you run it and you don't see your text report, it's just hidden behind the one line. So one way to find it is to go to the window button. So here's my high voltage momentary report. So let's take a look at that. I only have one bus that I faulted. Let me go back. I'm going to fault every bus just to give us some more. Interesting report. All right, so here's my half cycle momentary fault report. This only lists the high voltage buses. The low voltage is a slightly different report format. So I have symmetrical amps. I have the X over R ratio. I have the asymmetrical amps. And I have kind of the worst case, this is the ANSI C37 issue, the 2.6 symmetrical, which is a peak uh, current value. So this is basically what Easy Power is calculating, and it's applying some multiplying factors to get to the asymmetrical current based on the X over R ratio. So remember, the higher the X over R ratio, the greater the asymmetrical lamps can be and the longer that is going to take to decay. So that's the worst case. The higher the X over R ratio, the worse it is in terms of circuit breaker duties. All right, so that's my half cycle high voltage momentary report. And one thing we didn't talk about was these three buttons here. Um, we've been looking at momentary. We also have what we call five cycle or interrupting and the 30 cycle or relaying network. So remember I said that basically we're calculating a steady state 
fault current. It's kind of a snapshot at some particular point in time during the fault. So the half cycle is going to be the peak. Remember the peak fault current always occurs before the within the first half cycle. So five cycles would be the snapshot of the current at roughly five cycles into the fault. And then this will be the uh, the fault current at approximately 30 cycles because the fault current tends to decay over time. And so if we look at interrupting ratings, that's going to be slightly less. And if we look at 30 cycle, that may be quite a bit less because the, you'll have less contribution from your generator. So the top value is half cycle. Middle value here is five cycle. And the bottom value is 30 cycle. So the half cycle and five cycle are used for calculation of breaker duties. Well, the five cycle is used for high voltage breakers, medium voltage breakers. The 12, the 30 cycle is more of interest for relaying, coordination, that kind of thing. So basically it's solving three different networks because what happens as the fault progresses is we have these motor contributions, but depending on the size and type of motor, that motor contribution does not last very long. So after 30 cycles, all those motors can take a look at that. So here's, here's an induction motor. Here's the half cycle, which is going to be the maximum, 2,400 amps. Five cycle, it's 1,620 amps. At 30 cycles, it's zero, right? So by 30 cycles, all the, this motor will no longer be contributing fault current. So that it's going to make this value here less. Okay. All right. So let's go back and uh, talk a little bit more about the reports. We have, oh, we didn't look at the momentary report. Let's take a look at that real quick. So I have two separate reports. I have high voltage and low voltage momentary. So remember, you can always find those down here for the, in your window. So look at the low voltage. Now let me maximize this. So this is the typical low voltage report as a simplified version. Um, so I have, again, symmetrical amps for each bus. X over R ratio that it's computing, and you can see these are typically going to be much lower than for the high voltage system. Then the asymmetrical amps and equipment duty. So what we're talking about here is the fact that if I, even though I buy a circuit breaker that's rated, its short circuit rating is in symmetrical amps, it might say 42,000, 65,000 amps symmetrical. Even though it says symmetrical, it's still based on a certain maximum X over R ratio that it's going to be applied in. So when they test the breaker, it's tested at a certain X over R ratio or power factor. And if, if your system's X over R ratio exceeds what it was tested at, you will have to derate that breaker. And the way that we do that is we increase the duty amps corresponding to match what it, how it was tested, basically. So in this case, these X over R ratios are low. We don't really have an issue here. We'll look at an example of a, in a minute where we do have a little more, uh, things are a little more interesting. But that's the concept of the duty amp. Easy Power has automatically adjusted the symmetrical amps, and so you would use the duty amp value to compare to the breaker rating. This will give you an if an adjustment is necessary, the adjustment is made here. And then this duty amp value is applied to the, as a comparison to what's on the nameplate of your breaker, right? So remember the difference between duty and rating. The rating is what comes on the breaker. That doesn't ever change. That's a function of the breaker's testing and rating and design. The duty is what it's subjected to in that particular point in your system. So that can vary depending on what bus it's on and a lot of other variables. So, All right, so that's the momentary report. 
we do have, if I go back to the report options again, we have different formats that are available. Um, the default is this medium format, which is what we're looking at. There's some more options for. More detailed, we can look at symmetrical component output. And we talked about that, if that's of interest to you. Um, and we have some other options here for the remote bus current units and voltage units. Now, if I were to, um, well, I have a similar box to check here for that fit five cycle and 30 cycle. So I'm going to go ahead and add on the molded case breaker duties. And we're going to rerun that. So let's look again at the low voltage. Now you can see it's a little more complicated. Process is the same. It's going to look at each bus, calculate the fault current. But now I have, uh, it's calculating different duty amps for different types of equipment. And that's because these molded case circuit breakers are tested at different X over R ratios than the low voltage power circuit breakers. So they're assumed to be applied in further down in the system, so their test X over R ratios are lower than the low voltage power circuit breaker. So maybe if we look down here, if I look at this bus MCC 12C, we calculated uh, symmetrical amps of 14,638.7 and symmetrical of 17, oh, about 18,000. Okay, so my duty amps for a low voltage power circuit breaker are 14,638.7. That's exactly the same as this. And the reason is because the test XOR ratio, I believe, is 6.6. .6 for our low power circuit breakers, so there's no adjustment required. You don't get any extra credit, but there, you don't have to derate the breaker. If I look for molded case circuit breakers with interrupting ratings greater than 20,000, then I see that that value is the same as the calculated symmetrical amps as well. But if I look at molded case circuit breakers with interrupting ratings from 10,000 to 20,000, I see a higher number here. So what has happened is Easy Power has taken this number and adjusted that number to reflect the fact that this smaller, lower rated MCCBs are tested at an X over R ratio that's less than the 4.25. So we adjust that by increasing the duty amp. So if I had a multi case circuit breaker that was rated for 14,000 amps, I would have to use this number to compare it to instead of the 14,000. Either way, it would be over, but you, you would compare it with this number. So that's the adjustment that gets made in Easy Power. Now we'll take a look at a minute and we do the equipment duty at a more accurate way that we can calculate this, but that's the basis of why we have these different values listed in the short circuit report. Okay, so one of the options that we have, and probably you guys have uh, if you've been using Easy Power and created these reports, you've found is that we can export these to Word or Excel. So it's this, this short circuit report is actually basically an HTML table. So I can export this, I can print this, I can copy and paste it. And we also have these buttons here that I'll, if I click this, it's gonna allow me to import this directly into Word. So here's my Word table. And so I can copy and paste this directly into my report. So we have this um, capability for all the short circuit reports. They can all be uh, brought easily into Word or Excel, really any other kind of Windows compliant document, anything that knows how to interpret an HTML file. Okay, so again, I'll we'll take a look at the reports. We'll come back and talk about equipment duty report in a minute. The other options would be the five cycle and then the 30 cycle. And you're only going to, as we saw, you're only going to get the report based on the buses that you faulted. So 
you only fault one bus, you only have one bus that's going to show up in your report. All right, so that's kind of the basics of how we run the short circuit calcs. Um, some of the options available on the screen and also um, the reports. And I would encourage you to play around with the different report formats and uh, kind of figure out what, what works the best for you. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and, and talk about um, equipment duty. So um, it basically uses the short circuit calculation engine and applies those duty adjustments plus some other things we'll take a look at here in a minute to come up with the equipment duty check. So in terms of looking at it on the screen, it's pretty simple. We just instead of looking at the half cycle, we just do an equipment duty count. So I've got a little example file that we use in our classes. And let me see if I can find that. Okay. So here's a simple system. Um, and we're going to take a look at the equipment duty calculations using easy power. So again, if I want to do equipment duty calculations, I have to go to short circuit. It's, it's part of the short circuit package, similar to arc flash. If I want to do arc flash calculations, I need to be in short circuit. All right, so I go into short circuit focus. Now, instead of picking the half cycle or five cycle or whatever I want to pick, I'm going to say uh, equipment duty. That's this little button down here. I'm going to select that. And that tells me what I'm going to display on the screen. Now, I could still go to short circuit reports and ask for all these different reports, and I would get those, but this controls what gets displayed on the screen. So now I'm going to go to fault buses. Now, instead of displaying short circuit currents, I get a bunch of percentages, right? I don't see the, the fault currents themselves because I asked for the equipment duty report. So let's start here and take a look and see what these what these what this is trying to tell me. And basically, we see a bunch of equipment that turns red. Uh, Easy Power is still going to fault per bus. So the MCC is treated as a bus, but it's going to fault bus three. And based on its results for the fault current, it's going to look at then every device that's connected to bus three, all the breakers or fuses or whatever and figure out the equipment duty based on that. So if I run my equipment duty report or and display it on the screen, if I see a breaker like this that didn't turn red, that means it's okay, right? If you don't see anything next to the breaker or the device, that means there's not a problem in terms of equipment duty with that device. If it turns red, that means you have a problem, all right? So basically what this percentage is telling you in the, in the default configuration is that BL2, the short circuit current that Easy Power calculated through this breaker, the duty, including any adjustments that it needed to make based on the X over R ratio, that duty exceeds the breaker's rating by 7%. So that breaker is underrated or it's over duty. It's the same thing. So this means this breaker is being applied in outside of its rating, which is technically a violation of the National Electrical Code. It's saying that if I had a fault down here, this breaker might not be able to safely interrupt that, that much fault current. All right. So that's what that is telling me. Well, go down here to the MCC. Now, if you're familiar with Easy Power, you know that within the MCC, I can have a whole bunch of circuit breakers, right? I can have all my feeders and starters and all that, and I can define all those breakers. And within that breaker definition, there is an interrupting rating that I can define. So what Easy Power does is it looks at the lowest rated device 
in the MCC and reports back on that if there's a problem. So if I have 99 devices that are rated at 65,000 amps and I have one device that's rated at 22,000 amps, it's only going to care about the one device that's 22,000 amps. And if it's underrated, the, in, the MCC is going to turn red. So then you will need to go back, look at the report, and then go back and look at your MCC schedule and determine how many devices are actually underrated. But if, there, if there's one device, it's going to look at the lowest rated device, and it's going to identify it based on that, which is exactly how UL determines the short circuit rating of an MCC these days. It takes the lowest rated device in the MCC. All right, so let's go back up here and look at some of these other devices here that turned red. We have a fuse, and it's, again, this 21% means the short circuit current that we calculated through the fuse, the duty, exceeds the short circuit rating of the fuse by 21%, so that's a problem. Now we have these two medium voltage circuit breakers, or high voltage. Now here I have two numbers. I have a 12, minus 12% 12 and a 27%. It's the same for both. So it turns out that medium voltage breakers have two different short circuit ratings. They have a half cycle momentary rating, also sometimes called the close and latch rating. And they have an interrupting rating sometimes called a five cycle or three cycle rating. So remember we said the short circuit current tends to decay with time. And so we take credit for that in the breaker ratings by having a different rating for the actual interrupting. And the half cycle rating is more of a withstand rating. It has to be able to close into that magnitude of fault current and to stay latched in long enough to trip without coming apart. So those are the two values. The top value is going to be the close and latch rating, the half cycle momentary. Now this says minus 12%. So that actually means the close and latch rating is okay. Minus percentage means the duty is less than the rating, so that's okay. But the 27% there's no minus sign here. This is a positive percentage. That means the interrupting rating is being exceeded by 27% for both these breakers. So that's, again, a problem. Now, lastly, we'll look up here at this breaker. It turned red, but there's no percentages. So what does that mean? Now, that means, so if I right-click on this, I can look at the circuit breaker data. Well, even while I'm in short circuit, I can't change it, but I can look at it. This breaker is not defined. I have no manufacturer, I have no type, I have no style, and I have no short circuit duty. So because it's undefined, Easy Power is saying, I don't really know if this is okay or not, so I'm going to make it red just to flag it for you. Okay. So this is if you see a red device breaker or fuse with no percentage values here, that just means the interrupting rating or Short circuit rating was not defined in the data. Okay. Now a couple things. Uh, let's go back and uh, I want to go back to short circuit real quickly here. So I, did, I ran a half cycle fault calculation here. Now before when we did the bus fault calculations, we had those equipment duties based on the total bus fault current, right? Here, so in this case, it's 55,000 amps, 55,814. Well, let's think about what's really happening here. I have a generator, so I've got 25,000 amps coming this way. I have a utility source. I have 30,000 amps and some change coming down this way. Adds up to about 56,000 amps. But if I look at this generator breaker, can this generator breaker ever be subjected to 55,000 amps in this system? It will never have to interrupt that much because if the fault is on the bus or downstream this way, it's only going to have to interrupt the 25,101. 
And also if the fault, let's say the fault is right on the generator side of the breaker, then it's not going to see any of this fault current, right? It's going to see this current and this current. It's going to be the sum of those two. That's still going to be way less than 55,814. If I look at the utility breaker, it's a similar situation. If the fault's on the bus down here, this breaker will only see a maximum of the 30,612 symmetrical. It's never going to see this total 55,000. If the fault is on this side, let's say right on the loads to the utility side of this breaker, then it's only going to see the 25,000 plus this little bit of motor contribution coming back up. So it's never going to see the 55,814. So ideally, we would evaluate our breaker duties based on the actual maximum amps that they can see. And when I run the equipment duty report, that's exactly what Easy Power does. We call that the smart duty feature. When I fault a bus like this, and for ask for an equipment duty evaluation, Easy Power is going to calculate the bus fault current, then it's going to calculate the current through every device in both directions and take the worst case current through the actual devices. Let's go back to short circuit options. And I'm going to ask for an equipment duty report. I'm going to say include all devices. We'll say expanded to make it uh, see what it's actually doing. If you have a big system, you might want to just only include the violation and warning devices to shorten up your report. Well, let's say we want to see this. Now, if I go to window, I've got an equipment duty report. All right. So here's my bus three. We looked at that 480 volt bus. Here's that breaker that's turned red 7%. So you can see here what's going on. Here's the rating. It's 35,000 amps. If I'd looked at the nameplate of that breaker, it would say it's interrupting ratings 35,000. The calculated duty is 37,493. So it's adjusted this value based on the system X over R ratio and the test X over R ratio for this type of equipment. And it says that's a violation. If I look at the MCC, it found this. Remember, it's going to report on the lowest rated device. So somewhere in there, there was a TJJ breaker that's rated for 30,000 amps only. And we're computing a duty of almost 41,000. So down here is the powerhouse, the medium voltage. So here I have two, do, two values to look at. Here's the half cycle, which is the close and latch. And here's the interrupting. These are the ratings. Over here are the duties, half cycle and interrupting. So Easy Power compares the 58,000 to the 51,000. That's minus 12%. That one's okay. It compares the 30,435 to the 38,685 and says, oops, that's a problem. That's 27% over its rating. Okay. But if you go back and look, these values are only going to be the maximum current through the breaker. It's not the total bus fault current. Okay, so in the equipment duty report, all that other information is sort of hidden from you. It's only reporting back. It applies the smart duty function, applies all the necessary deratings, and reports back on the actual breaker duty per the ANSI standards. Okay. All right, so I see our time is running low. Uh, I think I have... Maybe some questions here. I have one uh, from Tom. So I'm going to, Tom Fritsch, I'm going to turn on uh, your mic. If you got a question, go, go ahead and ask it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, on uh, For motor contribution, how does a, uh, a motor, I mean a three-wire motor, contribute line to ground fault current? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't, okay. It, it, but it can contribute fault current, right? It's just it can't contribute zero sequence current. So there can be some fault contribution, 
on one phase. And it just cannot, it, it, we assume the motor is ungrounded, so it, there cannot be zero sequence current coming from the motor. Okay, so, so when you're doing, like you showed earlier, when you're doing a, uh, when you select the line to ground uh, fault current option, I mean the motor then, that motor can actually, I mean yeah, it is contributing line to ground fault current? I, yeah, let's take a look here. So here's my, okay. So here we see for the three-phase fault, I have, yeah, I think I misspoke. Here's the 24,000 or the 2,400 amps in fault for line to ground. You're right. There's no zero sequence pass, so there's no motor contribution for the ground fault. Okay. But you know what? When you did the, but that transformer is delta delta. The one you did with oh, you're right. had right. a Y secondator, how does it do it there? I didn't understand that. Let me see. Let me do it again here. Okay, yeah. So you're going to, let's take a look at the sequence currents. So you get positive sequence, negative sequence, but no zero sequence. Yeah, that's what I thought. So when I look, the positive and negative, these are kind of uh, somewhat uh, fictitious values, or artificial in some sense, but I, I know that for a line to ground fault, at the fault point, the positive, negative, zero sequence currents are all going to be equal. For the individual sources, though, that's not necessarily the case. Right? But when I change back to A phase, there is fault current coming from that motor for a line to ground fault. So I have A phase going this way, I've got B phase going this way, and C phase going that way. So that makes the sum of these currents zero here in the motor, which it would have to be, right? So does it? Okay, yeah. I, yeah that's something I just got to look at. Because so at, at switch gear SWG-5 at that bus, like if that were the only, on that bus, if, if there were only a motor, and then obviously the util, whatever's come from the utility, it would raise the value. At, yes. at switch, at yeah, I can I can double I can double click on this and turn it off, and it's the fault current goes down. Goes down, okay. So yeah, sorry, I've I probably confused everybody now, but um, so you you do get phase current in the A phase when you have a line to ground fault on A phase, even though this motor does not have a ground path. Yeah. Okay. So this is the smart breaker feature in Easy Power where I can double click on any device and toggle its position from open to close or close to open and it'll recalculate whatever it is we just did. Okay? Okay. Thank so you. hopefully I answered your question without confusing things too much. No, you did. I, I it's it's issues on my end. I just I, I just have to understand that concept. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Uh, let's see. I had a couple other questions here, if I can find them. Uh, Roger Brown. You there, Roger? Yeah. What was yeah. your question? Uh, about being able to view the bus trail in a similar way as the bikes turn red. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Roger. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so you have to speak up a little bit, I think. Oh, the red. We, I, I, you showed you can see the breakers. When they fail, they show red on the one line. Can you do the same on the Right. Line? So that's the um, – let me do this one because it will be more interesting. So that's the equipment duty. Right. So you just – you click on equipment duty, then you have to run the fault analysis. So these values turn red if the breaker or fuse or whatever is underrated. How about bus? The bus has different ratings too. Okay. Right. So that is a good question. So let me go back to database. And I believe it will check that. See, right now we don't have anything listed. Right. right. 
it's like a bus rating. So the bracing essentially would be the short circuit rating. So if, if I put a low number in here, not five, five kA. So now it will give me a report on the bus as well. If if you define the bus bracing or bus rating, it it will report back on that. It will do the same thing for the MCCs. You know, as if you have a yeah, let me go back to the database. So you can enter a short circuit rating here for your motor control center. It says bus, but it could be whatever, like if you had a UL label that said 25,000, it does check this number. Okay. And it'll report back on that. If this is the lowest value you have in, your, in the MCC, it will check that as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, good question. How about giving a count? on the number of devices held in the motor center. Yeah, you're not going to get that right now. It's only going to list the lowest rated device. So you would have to go back into the MCC schedule and kind of manually figure out all the ones that were underrated. All right. look, look at the MCC schedule, yeah. You're only going to get the one that's listed. How about viewing the first portion of the web? I, was I, I didn't quite catch that, sorry. Are these webinars being Published, we'll be able to look at them. Yeah, we are recording them. I'm not. They should be on the website at some point. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to happen, but I'll I'll find out for you. But yeah, they are being recorded. All right. Let me see. I think I have uh, one other question here, and as soon as I find it. Uh, David Farmer, got a question? David. David Farmer. All right, I think we lost David. All right, so, let's see. Have uh, Eric, uh, see if Eric has a question. Yeah, hi, Dave. Hi. Um, yeah, what was the uh, threshold for the, uh, the high voltage momentary uh, momentary ports for the voltage? It's what a thousand voltage go up to. A thousand volts. A thousand volts. Are you talking about the break off between what's considered low voltage and high voltage? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a thousand volts, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see if I have any questions down here. Okay. Um, is there a difference, there's a written question, is there a difference between uh, motor contributions between two 25 horsepower motors versus 10 5 horsepower motors? Um, not much. Um, the, the difference is going to be in the, primarily in the X over R ratio. I mean, there's going to be some slight difference. The larger the motor, the, the longer it tends to contribute fault current. And it has a higher X over R ratio. So um, in Easy Power, we have an option for. Oh, let me just take a second here. We'll, we'll, if I put a motor on this, this is going to be probably a review for a lot of you. We can define the motor as an individual motor or a group motor. And then based on the ANSI. C37 standards, there's a break between 50 horsepower and above and less than 50 horsepower. So the group would be I just add up the sum total of all the motors. It's 178, whatever it is, and I go to short circuit. Because it's a group, I have to tell it if it's greater than 50 or less than 50. So if I say it's less than 50 and hit calculate, it's going to magically plug in this X over R ratio of 3. 28834. So where that number comes from is if I go to tools and options, equipment, I believe. So up here it says X over R calculation for group motors. For the less than 50 group, it's going to take the X over R ratio for a 25 horsepower motor. If it's greater than 50, it's going to use a 100 horsepower motor. And you can change that. But that, that's what it's going to use. So 
Uh, the short answer is there is some slight difference. The basic amount of fault current is going to be very similar. There'll be some slight difference in the X over R ratio. So that, that can make a small difference in the totals. So, all right, so let's see. That was another question that I may have lost here. It says, there is no ability in a panel schedule to model a group. Is it still okay just to add the horsepowers? Uh, yeah, that, that should be fine. I'm assuming they're going to be small motors in a, in a panel board. So just adding the motors should be okay. You can plug in the, what you could do is find a representative X over R ratio for that motor, that group of motors, and just plug that value in in, in the panel schedule. So this is a question, even if it's two 45 horsepower motors, if you're talking about fed from a panel, yeah, I would just find the X over R ratio for a 45 horsepower motor and enter it as a 90 horsepower motor, if, if that's the question. Let's see. All right. so. We're kind of past our time, so I don't want to. I uh, do appreciate uh, all you folks sitting in today, and uh, hopefully the weather is better where you are than it is here. But uh, anyway, we'll be having another session next week that Satish will be doing uh, Thursday, uh, 10 o'clock Pacific. So I hope you guys can join us. And again, if you have questions, you can email me. If I don't get your question asked, feel free to email me directly. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in uh, a week or two. Thanks, everybody.